Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, April 2nd, 2015, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but this week, I mean it times two. We have so much to cover. I'm going to have to get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. Makers of Mountain Dew do not compensate me for this endorsement, but hey, Pepsco, you out there. Hook me up. Like I say nearly every week, Red Bull says I am too fat. Thank you very little, Red Bull. Go make love to yourself. All right, there's a disclaimer. Let me just sum it up real quick. All predictions are about the future. A lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Let me just kind of rush through this because we don't have much time this week. we got a lot to cover, I should say. Um, throw me a bone. You read my book. You like the book. Put me up a review on Amazon. We got one new review last week for that. I thank you. I think that was Nate that did that, and I think you're here today, Nate. So uh, shout out to my peeps. Shout out to Nate for putting that up. So I appreciate that. Um, what do we talk about? Well, we got a lot to talk about, so I don't want to spend too much time talking about what we're going to talk about. But uh, in a nutshell, I want to talk about being flexible. I want to talk about doing the right thing. And these are kind of like psychology type of things I want to get into. Uh, sloppy versus tight bow ties. Got kind of a last minute question on that, and I thought it'd be a good, uh, really good time to talk about that. And stock selection. Uh, I think I fat fingered, not in a week of charts, but somewhere else. Um, I put a, uh, I fat fingered the date. So uh, the I'm going to reissue the uh, promo. On that. Anyway, that'll make sense when I get to it. All right, and then also, I want to talk about IPOs too. But let's um, let's first talk about being flexible as a trader. And this is a little bit of an extreme example. And and I got asked, I think it was last week, about a TKO. Can a TKO happen within a pullback? And the answer to that is yes. Um, sometimes your best TKOs catch the mo that catch the most people off guard happen like right after a new high like you get a new high and then you get a big down day I can't really draw it in with this pen let's see it looks kind of like this you get a new high and then you get the TKO move because that just right here everybody's happy and you got some Johnny come lately's I just bought and then all of a sudden this happens at the short uh, the shorts come piling in because they're they tend to be top pickers so all of a sudden they're like jumping on the market and then the market when it goes right back up you take advantage of of the predicament of those aforementioned traders. Like I said last week, that's the importance or, or the uh, the basics of technical analysis, at least the way I do it, is you're reading the emotions of the market. We're not, um, I'm on this weekly panel, and we've got a lot of uh, good people that uh, show up for this weekly panel with timingresearch.com. And uh, you see the countdown on my website if you want to sign up and attend the shows. They're, they're really good. And you can get the recordings of the show off of uh, YouTube. But in, in these shows, we, we, would, we were asked, or the host at least, well, not the host, the, uh, the owner of the company, Timing Research, was asked by a financial astrologist he wanted to come on. And, you know, maybe there's some merit there. I don't know. Uh, to me, it seems like hocus pocus and BS, okay? And that's that's my answer for now and maybe somebody could show me that it's not but until proven otherwise I think it's total BS so when I talk about technical analysis I'm not talking about some kind of weird sect like that I'm talking about reading the emotions of the market and a TKO is like uh, in its most purest form you know that somebody got knocked out of the trade that's the whole deal is, is to wait for these people to get knocked out and then look to get back in and take advantage of the predicament of those people and if you Watch last week's Week of Charts. You can find that uh, on YouTube. And if you go to YouTube slash C slash Dave Landry, you could join my channel there and get all these Week of Charts for free. Anyway, so we had a TKO here. Now, this was on the cusp of rolling over, but it might just be a serious knockout. This thing went almost straight up, okay, over a fairly short period of time. So I'm thinking, all right, well, let's look to get this long this market if and only if it triggers a TKO somewhere up in here. So if it could come all the way back from this poor close, 
take out this entry, then maybe, just maybe, that stock is resuming its uptrend. And again, see last week's weekly chart, we had one look somewhat similar to this that looked like it was rolling over slash knocking out, or more than knockout, and turn around and went right back up. Now, a few days later, let's look at what happens. Well, it kind of crawls back up, and then it begins to stall out. So yesterday or day before, I forget when, I took it off my trading service as a potential long, and I put it in my Landry list as a potential short. Okay? So sometimes you have to be flexible. Right here, so far, it looks bullish, but all of a sudden, when it stalls out a couple of days later like this, this is beginning to look questionable and almost bearish. Okay? So... You have to be flexible as a trader. You have to see both sides of the market. And you can't have an opinion. And you have to be willing to change your opinion. So a few days ago, I was bullish. And now I'm somewhat bearish on this stock, okay, because it's beginning to stall out. So just be flexible and try not to uh, just believe in what you see and not in what you believe, I guess, is the thing to uh, say. Last night at dinner with my wife, she said, hey, listen to this quote. A mistake repeated more than once is a decision. And that's Paul Coho, I guess is how you say that. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to use that in tomorrow's Week in Chart because that makes a lot of sense. And one thing I was thinking about just before the show as I was out grabbing a do is I've had I have I, I, I use the word had I started to say have but I'm gonna say had because I'm cutting these people off I've had people email me for 15 years and it's the same story over and over Dave I didn't honor my stop Dave I'm over trading Dave I didn't wait for entries you know, I saw these great-looking setups, but I didn't take them because I just had a bunch of losses. And their sob stories go on and on and on. Now, do I F up on occasion? Absolutely. Am I perfect? No. Am I interviewing myself? Yes. But my point is, people continue to do the same thing over and over. And it dawned on me, it's like, well, these people, that's going to sound a little... little I don't know what word I'm looking for, vein or whatever. But I have a viable methodology. It's not a perfect methodology, but it's a viable methodology. It's trend following. It's trend following mostly with pullbacks and pullback-related patterns, patterns that are easily recognizable once you get a little bit of experience. And then you can pick the best stocks once you get a little bit more experience too. But these people, believe it or not, have – pretty much never bought anything. Well, I say pretty much because somebody, somebody might have bought the book, but they didn't really pay attention to what I'm saying in the book. Otherwise, they'd be using stops. They'd be waiting for entries. They'd be concerned about money management. They would know that sometimes the best action is no action. They would know that prior trades have nothing to do with the next trade that you're getting ready to take. Okay? So I'm thinking that I'm doing these people a disservice by just kind of telling them, oh, it's okay, don't worry, it'll be okay. So what's going to happen? So 15 years from now, I'm still going to be telling them that, and they've gone 30 years without becoming successful, so cutting them off, okay? The point is that they're doing the wrong thing, and they keep doing it anyway. It's okay to make mistakes. I think uh, Livermore said, if you didn't make one mistake, you'd own the world in a month. But to repeat those mistakes, okay, you've got to quit – repeating those mistakes because then it becomes a decision. I just think this is a beautiful quote. I'll probably talk about this uh, next week too. It reminded me of do the right thing. So obviously these people who have emailed me for 10 and 15 years and don't get it, they're not doing the right thing. They're doing something wrong, okay? And one of my thoughts is like, well, just do what I do. Follow my service or get the course. I know I'm soft selling here, but, but hear me out. Get the course and follow what I say in the course. And don't buy the stock that looks like an electrocardiogram. Buy the stock that cleans, that trades cleanly. Watch last week's YouTube. I talked a lot about stock selection there. Go to my website. Go to the stock selection course page underneath the store. Not right now. I want you to watch the video. But watch the video there on stock selection. I spent about an hour or so on a video. Okay? It's not. It's more than just a teaser. It's, it's an introductory uh, to stock selection, and there's a lot of good information there. Just that information 
alone, I'm confident, would have helped these individuals who have gone 10 and 15 years to get it. Well, why, why don't they get it? Well, they get it, but they're doing the wrong thing anyway. And this is an email I got recently. Oh, I say recently. It was, a, it was probably two years ago. Uh, somebody emailed me, a uh, nice lady. She says, I want to do what is good. I'm sorry. She says, uh, you know that passage from Paul, I know not to do, but I keep doing it. So I looked it up, and it's, I know I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. And my whole point is a lot of times people make mistakes, and they know they are making them. So getting back to the quote, a mistake repeated more than once is a decision. And I think that's just Brilliant. And this um, email inspired me to do two things. One, I did a webinar, or a week of charts, I should say, just on this, right around the time I received the email. And then the other thing I did was I wrote an article for Traders Magazine. And I'm not sure what languages they published it in, other than English, but it probably was in, uh, in Spanish. I know it was in Italian and a few other languages. I don't know why I'm saying that, just because I noticed that we've got uh, Traders English up here. So if you want to copy this article, uh, let me know, or, or I'll tell you what, better yet, I'll just put it up on my website, um, maybe on the sidebar under promotions or under links. So check those places uh, for that. You know what? I'll put it under links. You know what? I'll put it both. How's that? <laughs> Too much Mountain Dew, Dave. Anyway, so this was, a, anyway, this was in Traders Magazine, and it talks about doing the wrong thing and doing it anyway. And it's okay to make mistakes, especially when you're just starting out. But 5 and 10 and 15 years down the road, you can't keep doing you can't keep making the same mistakes, okay? Now, any questions on trading psychology as it relates to mistakes and doing the wrong thing? You know, no matter what you do, even when you get it and you use stops and you do everything perfect or as perfect as you can in this business, you're still going to have some losses. You're still going to make some mistakes, okay? But learn from them and don't worry about it. Get over it. Just say, you know what? I learned my lesson. I'm not going to do that again, okay? I learn and relearn lessons every now and then. I'm not perfect, okay? Um, I've traded these inverse triple leverage stupid ETF things and lost my butt. I've done it a couple times. Okay, so that second time was a decision, so I'm not going to do it a third time. I learned my lesson, okay? I won't do that anymore. So learn from your mistakes, and you're going to learn more from your mistakes, believe it or not, than you will from, from your success because you might, the market sometimes can be a bad teacher because you might not honor your stop, and then the market turns around and goes straight back up, and you feel great, and you're like, oh, I'm never going to honor my stop and get it the next 15 trades, you don't honor your stop, but then, of course, the market implodes, okay? Um, I'm saying the next 15 trades where you don't honor your stops, not necessarily 15 trades in a row. A lot of people get nervous when I talk about 15 bad trades in a row. Um, when I was talking about that, I don't want to digress too far, I was talking about someone who was using either two types of stops or their stock selection was not very good and they need to brush up on the stock selection. So, I mean, getting back to the, I don't want to get too far off a rant, I know too late, but getting back to the not doing the right thing and making the mistakes and keep making the mistakes and know that you're making the mistakes, it's like, like I said earlier, follow me for a while and if you suck and you're following me, then you don't suck. I suck, okay? <laughs> but if you could follow the plan, and I, and you see what I'm, you see where I'm going there? I don't know. Maybe I'm losing it. I just get, I'm just kind of fed up. Uh, lately, I just had, I'm just overwhelmed. I'm not overwhelmed. That's a bad word. I've just got a lot going on, and a lot, a lot of projects. And it's good though. It's I like staying busy. I really enjoy it. Um, but it's, I've reached the point where it's like, you know, I should have cut these people off 15 years ago, and they'd be doing a hell of a lot better today. But instead, I've created these, um, these monsters. Anyway, let me get down off my soapbox. Sorry about that. 
just venting a little bit. Um, I got to thinking there's three things to do, even and no, especially when things get iffy. And we've been talking about this quite a bit. Market had a little spill, came back a little bit. Yeah, now it's kind of back in the iffy column, and we'll flesh that out in a few minutes. But the first thing you want to do is follow your plan. The next thing you want to do is follow your plan. And the third thing is follow your plan, okay? Now, I once said, like, location, location, location is the real estate. Money management, money management, money management is the trade. And... Most of the follow you plan involves money management because people aren't honoring their stop. But it also involves a lot of micromanagement too. They get out of stocks when the stocks begin to kind of kind of lose a little momentum and consolidate. And they get out of a 20% gain. They pat themselves on the back of what happens. Stock takes off without them, without them. So this leads us to this week's. Dead Money Report. And this week's Dead Money Report is brought to you by TrendFollowingMoron.com. So to those of you who are new to Dead Buddy, I thought it was a, a widely known term, but I've, I've gotten a few emails. Dave, you say dead money. What do you mean? Well, according to Investopedia.com, it's a slang term for money invested in a security with minor hopes of appreciation or earning a return. Well, if you knew a stock would never go up that you were long, then you need to get out of it. Okay? But you don't know. And as long as your stop isn't hit, follow the plan. Okay? Now, this doesn't mean if a stock's going sideways and I'm just seeing it for the first time, then I'm going to run out and buy it thinking, that, oh, maybe it'll go up. No. You look for perfection when you're going into a trade, and then you forget about it, okay? All you do then is honor your stop. Now, the reason I said dead money redux in here is because we use this one as a dead money example a few weeks ago when it hit the profit target, I believe, on this day here. So from here to here, it's a pretty good trade. Ah, you look at all this in between. Well, wait a minute. It went kind of sideways. So what? Okay? So what? Honor your stop. Okay? It's all you have to do. Just honor your stop. If it comes down and stops you out, then you're wrong. You get out. Okay? But if it does it, what do you do? You stick with it. Sometimes the market moves in its own time frame. I guess always the market moves on its own time frame. Doesn't care about your time frame. Doesn't care about you. Okay? It does its own thing. So what we do is put a stop in place. And then when things start moving in our favor, we trail that stop up a little bit. And we follow along. That's what trend following is all about okay and we also I don't want to digress too far because this is another lesson altogether but we also allow that stop to widen now notice it was pretty it was pretty tight here because we're looking to capture short-term move but once things begin to work we let it widen out a little bit and I hate to use the word hope but hopefully if this thing corrects we ride out a fairly deep correction or we can withstand it and then it takes off it goes right back up IPOs can correct fairly deeply as you know any stock can correct fairly deepy, deepy, <laughs> deeply, as you know, and then turn around and keep on going. So just for fun, I looked at the spreadsheet, and I saw it was up 65%, and that's roughly about 208% annualized. So if this thing kept on keeping on, you're looking at like a 208% gain, okay, or just over that short period of time. If you could do that, on every trade, you would own the world really, really quick. Just for fun, I whipped out Paint Shop and I took the the graphic off the IPO market. And I put this is this is the stock we just looked at, so I'll put it on top. It's kind of interesting when you look at it like this, especially with this arrow beneath. It looks like it's just going straight up, 
Look how beautiful that is, right? But when you're sitting in this trade day after day, it's like waiting for pizza, wasting your life, you know? <laughs> but you got to be patient, and you have to just honor your stops. That's all you have to do. So there's a bull market in IPOs. Are you missing it? And I say don't. So go to davelander.com slash trade IPOs and check out the IPO page. Uh, on that sales page, it is a sales page, in the middle of the page, there's a video, okay? Don't watch it now because I want you watching me. But go to that middle of that page and play that video, and it's a pretty good video. Um, I've been criticized not by clients but by um, people who just like to give me their two cents on marketing and saying that I, I put I, my videos – I put too much into the videos, so I'm okay with that. Though I like to, I want everybody to really understand what they're going to get when they get a course from me. And if you like the the introductory video, you're going to love the course. And that's why I've only had one. I'll knock on wood. I've only had one stock selection course. And I've had zero IPO courses return. I've only had one stock selection course return. And the one that was returned, and I shouldn't make, I shouldn't be too excited because I'm sure as soon as I say this, somebody there's gonna be some returns. But the one that was returned, the guy emailed me day after day after day. He like ten emails. Is you said there's a money back guarantee? Are you sure? I'm like yes. Well, how would I get my money back? And it's like this is what will happen. And he asked me like 15 different questions in 15 different ways. And I said to myself, this guy's gonna get his money back. And sure enough, he clicked. And just about enough time for him to download the videos, he asked for his money back. So what? You know, there's one bad guy in a thousand out there. I don't care. That doesn't bother me. It's a risk I take with the money back guarantee. Anyway. Okay. Uh, so the IPO bull market continues. Now, here's the thing. When I say IPO bull market, I got to thinking when I was, when I was writing that copy. It doesn't mean that you go through the IPO charts and every chart looks like this. Or it doesn't mean that every chart looks like this, like this trill, okay? No, but what I'm saying is the bull market is has continued. Now, in last year when I did the course, most of them did look like that, okay? But now it's like the demarcation has increased. You've got quite a few that are going down, but you still have quite a few that are going up. So trading them is still worthwhile. So they either fly or they die. If that's all you take away today, even if you don't get the course, just watch the video too, but watch the free video. You'll see that you just have to buy the ones that go up and don't buy them if they go down. It's kind of like the old Will Rogers thing, okay? Buy stocks that go up. If they don't go up, don't buy them. So I would encourage you to study IPOs. Any questions on IPOs before we get to move to the next thing? I got this email this morning. Hi, Dave. Thank you so much for the reply and the additional insight in the bow tie pattern. I've been so busy that I have not had a chance to get back on here. I do have a question. Would following the bow tie pattern, do all the crosses have to occur on the same day if using daily charts, or can it stretch over two days or more? For example, if the 20 crosses the 30 on one day, but the dead does not cross the 20 until a day or so later, this still qualifies a bow tie crossover, and he says thanks. And this is Charles from my Yahoo group. Um, by the way, this Yahoo group, not that I digress too far, I've thought about shutting it down, but every now and then it gets revitalized. And, and keeping a group running, I would have to be in there every day throwing out commentary and other stuff, and I'm doing that on my website already, so I don't worry about doing that. But I keep it open just for this reason, because every few weeks or every month or two, somebody posts something, and then uh, the conversation gets started again. So I'm going to keep that open. And you, know, you could join that group if you want. I think it's uh, somebody else set it up for me. I don't know why they chose Dave Landry Groups, but that's what it's called. Anyway, so his point is, does the bow tie have to be tight? Well, if you just look at this one here, I'm just kind of looking at it as we do this. It looks like they all cross over one day. And you've got that bow tie, which looks like this. And you've got that fulcrum point in the middle. So that looks like a nice tight bow tie. But if you look a little closer, it actually took 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 several days. This took about three days, just kind of eyeballing it. 
for these moving averages to cross over, okay? So if you zoom this in quite a bit, it wouldn't look quite as tight as it is, but it looks like it happened just over one day. But to answer his question, yes, you want them as tight as possible, and they're probably not going to cross on one day altogether. Um, sometimes you can get what I call a forced bow tie. Let's say a market just begins to implode like this, and all of a sudden the bow ties do this. Well, that's not what the bow ties is desi designed for. So maybe you would get a very tight cross then, but the bow ties original intent or the author's intent or trader's intent as somebody people, some people say is to capture these gradual trends. Notice this market here it's just kind of gradually bumping along and it starts bottoming out and now it's starting to rally up. Kind of looks like a cup in a handle for those of you who are familiar with the cup and handle pattern and that's where bow ties often dovetail in. You get a bow tie and it kind of wakes you up like hey that's a cup and a handle and then it's also one, two, three I don't know if you count that as four, but it's got like five bottoms in here. So it's also uh, multiple bottoms. You could argue that, well, if you, you could connect these two and connect this one, and then this one here is the lower shoulder. So it is an inverted head and shoulder, but it's what's called a complex inverted head and shoulder. By the way, I use all this classical technical analysis, and um, I'm actually I'm actually been kind of uh, – uh, you know me, uh, well, you probably don't know me as far as personal life, but I, I do tend to become a hobby boy is what my mom, my mom, my mom too. <laughs> my poor mom, when I was a kid, she used to have to drag me around whatever hobby I was in before I could drive to um, to, to, to take care of my hobbies. But uh, God bless them for doing that for me. Uh, but my wife calls me hobby boy, and uh, one of my new hobbies might be, even though I've got a, quite a few of them already, but it might be collecting these old Wall Street books. A uh, friend of mine was looking for one, and I was able to acquire it, um, about a $4,000 book. I was able to require it, acquire it for a significantly uh, less than that, and so I sent it to him, and um, I got a less collectible copy for me in the meantime. But I think I'm going to start, start doing that. Um, and in these old books, they talk a lot about the classical technical analysis, and it's fantastic, and it's just wonderful. Uh, Schaubacher. Uh, you can get his book, and it's um, he's one of the the one the book I'm talking about was um, stock market theory and practice by Schaubach. So I'm looking forward to reading that one. Um, the one that I have is uh, let's see if I can find the name of it. He's got a he's got a uh, I can't my my cord doesn't reach over to the bookshelf, so I go get it. But he's got a good book on um, technical analysis. That's kind of like an Edwards and McGee type of book. And um, if you go to my website, it's somewhere on there. But if you just type in Schaubacher, you can pretty much read anything by Schaubacher. But you don't have to buy a 100-year-old version of it. You could buy a, a newer version of it on Amazon, and it's listed on my website. But the point I'm trying to make, believe it or not, I have one, is to study all these classical technical patterns and learn them, but don't rush out and try to trade them all, Okay. Uh, find some things that make sense to you. A cup makes sense to me, okay? Uh, I have to be able to wrap my head around the pattern for it to make sense. So well, a cup pattern, it's like, well, it's a market that you try to rally here, but it wasn't its time, and then it just kind of bottoms out, and then now maybe it's its time, and then now we have a bow tie, okay? Now I digress quite a bit, but the point is, do study all that classical technical analysis. Don't try to put it to use, direct use, but do combine it in with a bow tie or a gatekeeper or a first thrust or any one of my other patterns to help you stack the odds in your favor. So here we've got, again, we've got a nice cup and handle in the works, okay? And then we also have a tight bow tie. Now, again, this bow tie, if you look closely, one, two, three, probably about four days in the crossing, so that's okay. Three or four days is ideal. Now, let's look back here what happened. Okay, well, this 10-day tries to come up. It crosses both both of the 20 exponential and 30 exponential. The 20 came up, didn't quite make it to the 30 exponential, okay? And then it rolled back over. Then this would roll back over. This would roll back over, okay? So it was kind of sloppy. Uh, the Schaubacher book, um, his name is S C H A. B A C K E R, and um, I can't get to my bookshelf now, but
But it's a technical analysis. It's a book on technical analysis. Let me see. I might be able to reach it. Hang on. Is it here? Yeah, here. I got it in my hand. Uh, it's technical analysis and stock market profits. And it's the real Bible of technical analysis. So this is really, um, this is the book you need to read. Uh, Linda Rasky recommended this once in uh, one of her uh, speeches. So that's a good, um, I'd recommend you read that. Mine's uh, pretty dog-eared up. And then, of course, read Jesse Livermore. I just ordered a classic, uh, uh, I think a first edition of that, which is kind of exciting. Uh, Jesse Livermore, Reminiscence of a Stock Operator. And then uh, Smitten wrote a book about Jesse Livermore, about his life. Um, Jesse, it ended badly with Jesse Livermore. He put a bullet in his head. But read Smitten's book, too, uh, World's Greatest Stock Trader. And most of these are on my website. Uh, you can find them. If you go to the store, go to books, and then go more books you should read. I'd recommend you read that one, too. Uh, but Reminiscence of a Stock Operator is very important to read. So I don't know why I'm so sidetracked today, but the point is that you do want to use this classical technical analysis, but combine in a um, something like a short-term pattern, okay? Okay, the point is uh, Jesse uh, Livermore died because he put a bullet in his head because he had untreated uh, depression, not because he lost money. Yeah, you know what, Martin, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I probably should – I say that too much. I bring that up too much. Uh, that's not the story. The story is what he did, and he could care less about making or losing money if you read the book. It, it wasn't that important to him, and I think that he had this flippant attitude, and he learned from his mistakes. He made them over again a few times, but he learned from his mistakes. And you're right, he was a, he was a troubled individual. And I think his, um, I think it runs in his family. It's been a long time since I read the, the biography, but I think his son was pretty uh, effed up to put it to put it mildly. <laughs> um, but anyway, you can see we didn't really make the we didn't really make the crossing here, and notice that the market rallied up and then it came right back in, and then notice here it tried to cross again and it just kind of got sloppy. So by sloppy, I mean they're all kind of doing this. Okay, there's no cycles that are coming together. When you have them cross tightly like this, it hints that all the cycles are coming together: the longer term cycle, the shorter term cycle, okay, the intermediate term cycle, and that the trend might be actually turning. Okay, and you want to trade the bow ties. Just by the way, I have another YouTube out here in bow ties. You want to trade them off of multi-year lows or ideally all-time lows, especially when you have a nice, nice base like this. Go back to 2013, I think, if memory serves, or 2012. I forget when. When the solar stocks bottomed out, you had a lot of cup and handles. Then you had a lot of low-level bases, and the stock just gets kind of sold out um, in those cases, and then. Uh, I call it the Phoenix strategy. Uh, my friend Dick Fruth, if you go to, um, he'll probably be listed in, as Richard Fruth. Richard Fruth on YouTube, oh, I'm sorry, on Amazon. Uh, he's, got a, he's got a book, uh, I think it's in Kendall. It might be hardcover too, but I think it's mostly in Kendall uh, on parabolic stock moves. And he talks a lot about the low-level stocks like this. In fact, that's, um, I call it, it's kind of, we came to the same conclusion but different ways uh, and he's an old timer he actually by the way he actually went spent time with Edwards and McGee I don't know if it was Edwards or McGee I guess it was Edwards that he actually spent time with uh, when he was a young kid he looked up Edwards and uh, got on a train and went spent time with him in his office so it's fascinating to be around some of these old time guys and um, anyway I digress but yeah you want the bow tie as tight as possible now my answer in, when I uh, posted at the Yahoo group was also that, okay, just because, let's say they are kind of sloppy in here and they're not tight, they didn't, they didn't cross and make this good-looking fulcrum point like this, what you uh, might also want to do is just say, okay, well, it's not a bow tie, so let's not worry about that. But maybe there's some other pattern that's worth trading. And if there's not, there's not, okay? This is the... Um, any questions on anything so far? And we'll hop into the charts in just a few seconds. Um, stores open, davelander.com slash store. And then um, somewhere, I don't know where, ooh, I think this is supposed to be three. I think this is 0403. 
for tomorrow for Good Friday, the end of the uh, sale. Somewhere I don't know where, or I either said or fat figured the um, the promo code for the uh, stock selection course. Okay, and it's supposed to be 0403. See, I, I fat figured again here, and then it ends on Friday. Okay, I had it end on Monday, but I had 0403. So just to fix that problem, and then just go to store to find that. You could click on the link on my homepage on that. Um, I have a free report right now on, on the store. If you're new to the methodology, I suggest you read it, even if you're um, experienced with the methodology. It's 21 pages, so check that out. You can download that off my website. Uh, again, the IPO course, is, I think I still think there's a bull market in IPOs. But, Dave, what if the bull market ends? Well, so what? You'll have the knowledge for the next time the uh, – IPOs have a bull market, and so far, there's been selected stocks like that aforementioned Trill, which has uh, done really well. And again, here's the promo code. This is the right promo code. This is a zero, zero four zero three four. Good Friday, which is tomorrow. So if you do get that, you'll save three hundred bucks on that. And then again, my YouTube channel, youtube.com, C. Dave Landry. If you subscribe to that, I don't think uh, you're not going to get, well, in fact, I know, you're not going to get any emails or anything. You'll just, when you log into YouTube, you'll be able to have direct access to my videos. You won't have to go dig for them. All right, any questions on anything here before we hop out to the charts? Uh, you guys can start asking questions about individual issues or just anything in general. And uh, what I'll do, uh, if you do ask about a stock, if you're new to the show, just ask about one stock at a time and hit carriage return so I can uh, answer it and then um, talk about it and then move on to the next one. But if you want to ask about 10 stocks, that's fine. Just hit the stock name and then hit enter. Okay, let's take a look at the overall market and then let's uh, take a look at some sectors in here, some selected sectors and see what's happening. Well, let's start with the biker and work our way out. First of all, today obviously good day, okay? You go back a couple days, and it was really a bummer. And I was pretty much cautiously optimistic on this day here because this market was pretty much going straight up. And it looks like at that particular point in time, let's take a measurement off of that. Here's your all-time high. We were within a percent and a half of all-time highs. So I felt like, well, let's err on the side of the long, long-term trend and assume that everything is still relatively okay. And then the market sold off fairly hard, especially, what day was this? Monday? No, it was Tuesday. So Tuesday really scored as a bummer. And when we look at the sector action, you can see the damage that was done to the sectors on Tuesday, okay? But as usual, what, is, what does Big Dave say? Take things one day at a time, okay? So today, so far, knock on wood, ow, hurts my head, we're having a decent day in the market, okay? Let's stick back, uh, tune in, what is it? Check back often. So things were looking a little iffy just yesterday. Things still look a little iffy. And then that, my whole point is what do you do? Well, Nothing. You followed a plan. Let me just see what date this was, just for S and Gs, okay? So on two twenty-five, let's say you had a magical system that told you that the top of the market would be on two twenty-five. And let's take a look at this stock. Let's find two twenty-five in here. This is the big winner. Okay. So oh, that's the top of the market. Let's say you had a crystal, uh, what do you call those things? An eight ball. You shook your eight ball and it said, hey, that's the top of the market. You had a crystal ball. It says, that's the top of the market. 225. And then, lo and behold, stocks sold off a little bit. Okay? But since then, it's going up 60%. Okay? So you think you're smart and you're like, well, I'm just going to get out of the market and start to look a little iffy. And then you miss this 60% gain. Well, guess what? You miss a few of those and you catch some losers. You're going to have a losing year. And that's one thing I haven't solved for. And it, you know what? If I solve for the fact that outliers really help the system, 
and and I've had people peers tell me, Dave, stop stop making it sound like it's elusive, but it's not. It's like you can catch you can catch these occasional outliers just by following some very simple patterns. There's nothing magical about them. I mean, I'm picking them using the same stuff that I'm I'm teaching. When I did the, uh, I feel like I'm soft selling, but when I did the stock selection course after about six or seven hours of lecture. I said, all right, let's take everything I just said, and let's go look for that in charts. And the charts that we found were phenomenal, and they went up significantly. Not that, will they always do that? No. But if you keep it simple and follow the plan, and don't get too caught up when things begin to change, okay, and just follow your plan, and you do just fine. Now, before I digress too far, I know too late. Getting back to the P's, we draw a horizontal line going backwards, and you can see, you can go all the way to late November, and the market hasn't done anything, okay? So we are beginning to go quite sideways in here. So I would recommend that you become even extra selective in your stock picking. Let's take a look at NASDAQ. NASDAQ was looking pretty good for a while. Had a pretty scary little sell-off, but it did hold the top of its base. Went on to make new 15-year highs, not quite all-time highs. By the way, you people said NASDAQ would never see new highs again. So far, you've only been right for 15 years. Ha-ha. Then, of course, we had a little spill in here. 4,800 seems to be the magical number there. I would be very concerned if we came below 4,800. As long as we stay above it, I'm not going to get too excited. Maybe the market will just consolidate and, like I've said before, make a box on top of box, Darva style. That would be wonderful. Okay? I guess that's another book I have to collect. Uh, that's another one you should read, by the way, FYI. How I Made $2 Million in the Stock Market. I think that's the name of it. Um, good book. You can't run out and trade exactly like that today, but it does. I, I tell you this, if you did that versus what these uh, – these guys have been doing over and over again for 15 years unsuccessfully, 10 or 15 years unsuccessfully. You probably would be, I think you'd probably have some, at least a decent success here or there. You wouldn't be uh, emailing me crying, oh, I'm not honoring my stop. I'm, I'm trading in less than ideal conditions, blah, blah, blah. I don't know why I sound like Clinton. <laughs> anyway, so NASDAQ so far consolidating above 4,800. So far, so good. There, let's take a look at a Rusty. Rusty is the only silver lining out there in the indices, at least. And so far, so good at the Rusty. In fact, it's actually up a little bit today, and I think that's important. We're within 1% of all time highs in the Russell 2000. And I've been preaching, maybe I preached it too much. Like back here, I'm saying, hey, it's impossible, or I find it impossible, or hard to believe at least, that we could have a bear market with the rusty at or near all-time highs. So I think I would continue to err on the long side. Now, it doesn't mean I'm rushing out and going crazy on the long side, but I do have some setups that are worth taking, okay, on the long side. I am seeing a few shorts, and I'm beginning to question whether or not I should be putting on a couple of shorts in here just because I'm getting the setups. And as I've said before, you kind of want to let the setups kind of tell you what to do. And it's okay to take a short or two as long as you have a stop in place to get stopped out. My only concern is the setups I'm seeing on the short side are in some of these go-go areas. So you might be better off, and this is going to open up a can of worms, but if you are looking at like a biotech or a semiconductor or something, that's set up beautifully as a short, you might look into buying puts on them instead of outright shorting, just in case they come out with an FDA announcement or some sort of electronics that allow us to uh, harness the energy of the sun or whatever easily or more easily or whatever it is. So uh, just want to throw that out, but uh, you're on your own when it comes to options because that's a, that's a, mixed, uh, that's a big can of worms. Anyway, so Rusty kind of hanging in there, not hanging in there, not the most beautiful trend in the world, but hanging in there nonetheless. I'm kind of bullish on the energies in here. I think they're beginning to bottom out. I'm more excited about them on an individual issue basis than I am a um, than I am on an overall basis. That stock I just showed you is TGA. That's in the service for today, uh, and it's just triggering 
right now. So you can see it's a nice little bow tie in here. So again, I'm more excited about bow ties on an individual stock basis and something like this TGA than I am in the overall energies. But you can see the overall energies are beginning to bottom out. So that's kind of the silver lining of this uh, market is that the there are some areas that are bottoming out. Now what's, what's a bit of a bummer is if you take a look at like drugs, drugs uh, had a first thrust down, a micro first thrust, and so far they're in a little bit of a spill out of that. So that's a little concerning to be biotech looks even worse now biotech does have a lot of support below the market okay and you've got a micro first thrust in these areas also notice the bow ties are beginning to come together okay usually not all the time but usually if you get a bow tie off of all time highs you better pay attention because sometimes not all the time but sometimes you can have pretty serious tops i mean I know I've said this a thousand times and some of your eyes will glaze over, but like if you go back and look at the S&Ps, even on like a weekly basis, and you go back to like some of the major all-time bottoms and all-time, not all-time bottoms, the major tops and bottoms, like 2000, in 2000, you had a bow tie on a weekly. In 2007, I think, almost, it's roughly 2007, at least early 2008, you had a bow tie on a weekly. In 2003, you had a bow tie up on a weekly. The bow tie in 2009 took a little while to form. You were a little late to the party, but so far it's uh, going about 100% since that bow tie. Okay, uh, let's see what this move down is. I'm curious. So you had about what a 50% drop? Yeah, 50% drop from that bow tie to weekly. Uh, you had a bow tie to weekly here. And you had about a 65% run, and then let's go way back to 2000 and see what happened. You had about 70% drop in the Nasdaq. Yeah, about a 40-something percent drop for that bow tie, okay? So, uh, you know, if all you walked away with today was stay on the same side of the market as weekly bow ties, you probably uh, you probably would have paid for your webinar. I'm just saying. Anyway, write that down. Okay. Um, what else is going on in sectors? That, that, that's my big concern. You got biotech, you got drugs, and then take a look at, like, the semiconductors, or not like the semiconductors, the actual semiconductors. And you can see that we've got a first thrust down, we've got a minor double top, uh, and then we also have the bow ties coming together. A little support of the market, so that's a good thing. Now, you don't want to rush out and sell the farm, but you want to make sure you really, really like the setup on the upside, given what's going on here. So we could be in the early phase and roll it over. I hope not, okay? But... In markets, you can't go off what you hope, okay? It's okay to hope something, but, you know, hope in one hand and, you know, the routine. Um, let's see which one gets filled first, right? It's okay to hope, but live in reality, okay? So this looks a little dubious to me, and don't get me wrong. I want to be a bull, but it's beginning to look a little dubious. Retail kind of hanging in there. It's lost a little bit of momentum. I'm sure if you plotted some sort of oscillator down here, which I'm not really into doing, uh, you would see that it's lost some momentum. And you can see the moving averages are beginning to kind of flatten out and come together a little bit. So maybe retail's losing steam, but so far, eh, you can still draw an arrow in here. So just kind of keep this mentality as you go through your sectors. I don't want to bore you to go through too many of them. But just, is it going up? Is it going down? Is it is the momentum slowing? And what are the bow ties doing? And the other thing you can do, which is kind of fun, especially when the market gets a little iffy, and it's real simple. Just put your 50-day moving average in there. And I always forget about the 50-day moving average. And when the market begins to sell off a little bit, I'll be on one of these panels or web shows or whatever, or even these webinars, and guys like you will point out, hey, Dave, uh, look at the 50-day moving average on whatever. Like, oh, you're right, especially like Phil, you in here? I don't know where Phil is today, but Phil's a big fan of that 50. He likes to trade bounces off the 50. There you are. Glad you learned it. Yeah, Phil's a big fan of like right here, a little kiss of the 50. That's his favorite thing. Uh, combine that with a little bit of daylight, I think you probably got something. Let us uh, let me just show you. I don't want to speak for Phil, but I know he likes that 50. And, and I have to agree. And he's got me looking at it more and more and more. So just find something simple and stick to it. But look at the daylight here. Nice little daylight here. Nice little daylight here. Meaning the lows are greater than the moving average. That simple little technique can really help to keep you on the right side of the market. Let's take a look at like drugs, see what's going on there. See, so far... Okay, we haven't even violated that 50-day moving average. That sounds kind of horrible, huh? It's funny. I'm into cars, and it's like um, the uh, 
when I first started learning about them, it's like that they use the word unmolested. <laughs> you mean somebody would molest an old car? That's horrible. Um, anyway, I better stop before getting any worse. Uh, but you can see, so far, so good. Nice little daylight, okay? But shorter term, starting to get a little bit iffy in here. I'm just saying, okay? Unless I get too excited. I had a little kiss back here, the 50, and then it went on. A little kiss here, okay? And then it went on. So, so far, so good. But starting to turn a little bit, starting to get a little questionable. Some of these areas like hardware uh really concerning. You can see they're down towards the bottom of their range. Look at that 50, right in the middle of their range, okay? So they're down below the 50, down towards the bottom of the range. So, yeah, keep an eye on that 50-day moving average. It doesn't hurt, okay? And you can see the civvies are just right on there. So they're either to go on to new highs or then this might be it, okay? But they do have a little support underneath. Uh, what else is happening? Oh, real estate. I'm not a big fan of, of the REITs, but uh, real estate, if I could find it. Real estate was selling off, and then it rallied all the way back, tried to get the new highs, okay? And then now it's just kind of meandering in here. So that was a bit of a, a, of a reaction to the rate shock. And what's kind of fascinating is the uh, market was just blowing off the fact that rates were headed higher, bonds down, rates up, okay? And then they, we had this rate scare somewhere in here. I forget. What's, what was the top of the market? The 25th? Yeah, we had a rate scare somewhere in here. And rates did drop. I'm sorry, bonds did drop. means rates go up, okay? But now look what, look where bonds went, okay? They're above where they were when we had this rate scare. So it's so interesting. You can't, you can't use absolutes when it comes to markets. You can't say, well, well, uh, interest rates are 0.1 percent now, and they were 0.0 percent. So that means the stock market to sell off. It's like no, it's the it's a reaction to the news. It's a reaction to the event that's important. But I find it fascinating that the market is a little iffy in here, and rates are actually lower, meaning bonds are actually higher than they were before this whole question um, started. Bonds cup and handle here. Well, I don't like high level cup and handles as much as I used to. Uh, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, you're talking about a high-level cup and handle? Yeah, it's okay. I mean, this was kind of a cool cup and handle back here. When, years ago, I wrote about what I call the running cup and handle. And that, believe it or not, Phil, is when a market makes a cup and handle above the 50-day moving average. And lo and behold, look what happened here. You've got a nice little cup and handle uh, right above the 50-day moving average. Look how beautiful that is. Let's uh, Let's zoom in on this. So, yeah, I mean, it's like I guess i got to remember all the stuff that I once knew sometimes. It doesn't hurt to take a step back every now and then. But, yeah, look at this. you got a cup and handle. I prefer it. It's kind of a micro cup and handle here, you can see. Micro cup and handle here and then a bigger picture one here. And then look at that, right above the 50-day moving average. Look how beautiful that is. That's kind of cool. So, yeah, maybe I need to retrain my eye to go back to, to the year 2000 when I was looking at these running, what I called a running cup and handle. That's in the first book, by the way. Dave Landry on swing trading. Okay, I think that's enough as far as the sectors. Uh, is it HMOs? HMOs another one of those areas that are doing pretty good in here. Um, you know, it's not rocket science. Just look at these areas, okay, and ask yourself, are they bottoming out, are they topping out, or are they chopping sideways, okay? That's all you got to ask yourself, or are they trending, okay? So you look at healthcare plans or HMOs, they're still trending, okay? Yeah, there's always going to be a, double, a, a cup and handle. Phil's pointing out a, a double top within a cup and handle, and that's the beauty of a cup and handle is it is a double top, if you think about it. Uh, I guess that's kind of why I came up with the double or how I came out with the double top knockout. But if you think about a cup and handle, it's a double top, okay? But when that top gets taken out, and this is why I like them at low levels because you've got more, you know, you've got everybody that's on the wrong side of the market from way back here, okay? And if it's shorts, they're going to be forced to cover. If it's longs that bailed out, they got to think about buying back in. But, yeah, you're going to have a double top within a cup and handle. That's normal. Uh, Hound of the Baskervilles, I forget who wrote about that. I'm so bad. I, I feel horrible. I'm so bad about not giving people credit. I'm going to say Martin Pring, but it might have been, uh, it might have been Elder. You know what? Let's give Elder credit for that. I'm pretty sure it was Elder. And... 
he talked about the Hound of the Baskervilles. The story with the Hound of the Baskervilles, and I hope I have that name right, is that there was a, I guess it was an estate called the Baskervilles, and there was a murder at this estate, but the dogs didn't bark. So why didn't the dogs bark? Well, dogs didn't bark because it was an inside job. Somebody in a family who the dogs knew and wouldn't bark at killed whoever in the estate, and that's how they figured out it was an inside job. I don't know if it's a real story or not. But his point, he was uh, equating it to like a, uh, uh, the Hounds of the Baskervilles. He was equating it to chart patterns like a, like a, um, a head and shoulders top that the market goes on to make new highs. Well, if you think about like a double top, like we just said, which is what? A cup and handle. The market goes on to make new highs. Then it has faked out the people. So it actually becomes powerful. Elder. Okay, so it is Elder, Howard. Howard confirms that it is Elder. Thank you, Howard. It's in trading for a living, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you for that. So now I don't feel bad about not giving credit. All right, let's uh, let's hop into individual stocks. Uh, you you can still ask questions about anything, but I'm kind of anxious to jump into the charts. This is the fun part of the show. All right, let's uh, let me get shift gears here. All right, James wants to know about SMMT. Look at that. See, there's your IPO bull market right there, okay? And a little buy pattern, I think we, did we use, was this one? The buy pattern would have been, uh, without giving anything away, would have been on this day here. This would have been your buy on that one. So, yeah, um, it's no longer a buy because it triggered on this particular day. James, you have the course, I'm pretty certain. You're on the service, so. I'm guessing you had the course, too. Uh, but, yeah, so far, so good. Next pullback might be worthwhile. A little bit on the thin side, but with IPOs, I'm a little lenient on the on the uh, volume. And what I like to do is come in here. See, you had a billion and a half volume on the first day, uh, 200,000 second day, light day, 150,000. So as long as you got some big volume days in here, it means there's somebody out there that wants to, to buy and sell it to give you some liquidity, okay? Greg, I like that stock. We can't talk about it because it's on today's Landry list, but I'm going to give you a high five on that. Uh, bring it up again next week, and if it works, we'll uh, we'll talk about it. Darvis, great because he teaches like you do. Buy it, sell it, stop, and wait. Well, thank you, Richard. You know, to, to use my name and Darvis in the same sentence, that's like you freaking made my day, man. Thank you, Richard. That's awesome. C-O-T. And, yeah, well, it's consolidating, okay? The the thing I don't like about this one is that it did, it made a quantum leap higher, but you're, I think you're talking along the lines of Darvis, right? Uh, it made like a quantum leap higher, and it did it over, the, the majority of the move is over one day. And it's kind of akin to the bottle rocket thing that I'm talking about, uh, that I've talked about in the stock selection course. And if you go in and watch the, the intro to the course, I think I talked about it in there too. And I, I know I've talked about it in a week in charts. So you just get this one or two big days, big pop, and you're not getting the follow through. So that becomes more of an aberration than anything. So I wouldn't be too excited about buying this stock until or unless it made new highs and then pull back again. So I would just hold off on that. Uh, yeah, James, once that looks good, That's that's been on my Landry list for a while, as you know. And uh, it was on way back here. It was a pullback. This is a hot IPO pullback back here. And then so far, so good. So, again, this is the – not every IPO is going straight up, and that's why you can't buy them all. But what you can do is you look at the ones that are going up, and you look for some specific patterns, and you buy them. And guess what? You still could be wrong, so you should stop. But we've been fairly fortunate, knock on wood, again, with those. I'm a little nervous about how many times I said knock on wood today. John wants to know about CLNY. CLNY. Um, well, my problem here is that it pulled back to the prior base, top of the base, okay? And so because it's done that, I would it would have to make it to do highs again. So we'd have to come up here. And then look to play the next pullback for me to, to take a trade in, in something like this, okay? If you're already long, then stay long and just follow your stops or trail your stops, whatever you want to do. Um, honor your stops, I should say, not trail your stops. But 
Uh, it doesn't jump out at me as a great setup. I think you could probably find something that's trending a little better than that. FCH as a long. We got Andre from Russia joining us today. It's always flattering. I should have looked you up when I was there. I forgot to. It was. I spent more time in the air than I did uh, than I did on the ground over there. I think. Yeah, this looks pretty good. See, unlike this other one, notice this one took off. It did pull back kind of deeply, but it did stay above the the base. Okay. It's a REIT. I'm not crazy about REITs, but so far so good. The problem with REITs is they're looking a little iffy in here, but it's already triggered and it's rallying out of that pullback, so it's not a new setup now. I think I would pass for now. If you're already long, stay long. And, again, it's hard for me to get excited about a REIT, but you can't argue with the pattern. The pattern is definitely there. So whoever asked about that, I think it was John. Good eye on that one. HCHC for art. HCHC. Yeah, that looks good. Uh, here's the problem, though. It's super duper duper thin. But Dave, you were just looking at an IPO. It was pretty thin. Yeah, but it was it was like I said, they had lots of volume on certain days, so it was okay. Uh, but it's when it gets this thin and it's been around this long, uh, be real careful. Now you could still trade these stocks. It's just going to be a little bit more dangerous, and you can't trade them as an institution. But as a private trader, yeah, you could trade them, but just be darn careful. Uh, my cage just slipped out. You heard that one say, just be darn careful if you do. <laughs> People are like, I didn't know you were cage. It's like, yeah, it slips out every now and then if you watch these shows. Oh, that's bad. But um, pretty big thrust higher, kind of a little scary based on the magnitude, but not bad. It's not a bad-looking setup, but very dangerous uh, based on the low volume. But certainly, you know, if the volume was a little higher, I'd, I'd probably give you a high five on that one. Zag is along for John. So good eye art, just a little thin, just a lot thin. As a general statement, you probably want to avoid it. Like I could never, I could never put a stock like that on my on my core trading service. Okay, somebody's asking about Zag is along. I'm going to say no. This is a reversal gap strategy. If anything, I think it's a short. Unfortunately, it's got a lot of support down here, so you'd only be able to get likely. Nah, you know, who knows? Stranger things could happen, but. Your trade would only be down from like, uh, let's say, eight down to seven. I just don't think it's worth it. I like to get at a trade where I have potential unlimited gains. Go back to that trill. Let's not beat the dead horse on that, but let's look at that. It's up here in clear air, okay? We got in over here. The air was clear. Your breakout pattern, believe it or not, was way back here. So you got clear air up here, and then you've got clear air above it. So there's nothing to stop it, whereas this has got a lot of support below the market to stop it. So I would not short it. Uh, but it does look like a short. It definitely does not look like a potential long. Anytime you need to gap down within 10 days of a new high, you have to uh, be careful with that, okay? And if you read 10 best reversal gap strategy, that's a, that's a neat little pattern. And just to, just to read his digest of the pattern is a gap down within 10 days of a new high and then look to trade the pullback. It's a beautiful setup on the short side. Unfortunately, again, too much support under the market, okay? Howard says, does the 4810 to 4823 gap on the NASDAQ influence you? Well, let's take a look at that. Okay. 4810. When was that gap? 4810 to 4823? Give me a date. What are we looking at? Yeah, we'll come back to you, Howard. You're talking about this gap here, 48.10? No, that's not it. Yeah, uh, come back with me on the gap, 2.2, 2, 12, 2.12. 2, 12. Well, I don't worry about it anymore. If it's if it's within the 2.12, 2.12, way back here? You can't even see that. Let's take a look at that. Oh, yeah, you can't even see that. Squint your eyes. I mean, that's not much of a gap. I mean, look at the top here, okay? But gaps are, are can be a support level, okay? What was the stock we were just looking at? Um, there's an old Wall Street adage that gaps are filled. The Chinese, oh, they call them the window. Oh, windows are filled. Windows are filled. No, they're not. 
you go look at charts, you'll see gaps that, that don't get filled for years and years and years. Okay, here's a gap right here. Had been filled in what six, seven, eight months. So what? Okay, it's, it doesn't mean it's going to get filled. If anything, a gap is a support level. And lo and behold, look what happened here. It came down to where the gap, a support level. So don't think that a gap's going to get filled. That's the problem with reading these books. Okay, I know I'm a big fan of all these books, but some of them are just plain wrong. And it's funny being around some of these old timers. Uh, we, we actually talk about how some of these things are just plain wrong in some in some of these books. And I don't want to throw anybody under the bus because you know maybe I'm FOS and some stuff. But uh, some of them are, again are just plain wrong. Windows don't always get filled, or gaps don't always get filled. If anything, I see them as a momentum thing. Traded the direction of the gap, okay, for the most part. But in this particular case, this is a reversal gap. I doubt that it will get filled. What were we just talking about? I oh, uh, the NASDAQ, sorry. Okay, so that's such a tiny gap, it doesn't matter. But it, it corresponds with what? It corresponds with the top. It's 4,800, which is the top of the range. So that's more important. So, yeah, I'm watching 4,800, not because that's where the gap is. Okay, but that's because where the top of support is. Now, with that said, keep in mind a lot of technicals come together at what? The same point. I don't remember where the 50 is in here, but watch. I bet something amazing is going to happen. Well, maybe not. Uh, it's above the, uh, oops, fat fingered it. Uh, it's above the 50. Let's put a 200 in just for S&Gs. Okay. Now, as I often preach, a lot of times technicals come together at the same point. Let me get rid of this one-day moving average I fat-fingered. I don't know how I did that. I hit a key in the moving average change. Anybody knows how to do that? Let me know. Okay, so where's the 200-day moving average? Roughly 4,600. Where's the bottom of the trading range? Roughly 4,600, okay? Where's the top of the trading range? 4,800. Where's the gap? 4,800, okay? So a lot of times, a lot of technicals will come together at the same point, okay? Where's the bottom of this range? Well, right around where this gap is. So just don't get too caught up at any one event in and of itself, but do pay attention to everything and when you're building your case. Right now, the NASDAQ so far is above its prior base, so that is a good thing. Right now, the NASDAQ so far is nicely above its 200-day moving average, so that is a good thing. Right now, the NASDAQ so far, let's put in a 50, but don't get too caught up at a small little one-day gap like that, okay? So right now, it's kind of sitting on its 50, okay? Watch out for the death cross. The media's going to have a big old freak out when the 50 crosses below the 20. That's a death cross. Oh, goodness. Okay, John says, is there a TKO on the 27th of March for the stock SCHL? All right, let's take a look. SCHL. Well, 27th of March, let's take a look at that. No, not really. Uh, you mean the 26, I guess. No, because a TKO, let's get a, let's get a blank chart up here. You got to remember that TKO is, the stock is trending. And you should be able to draw your big arrow on the chart like that, okay? And then you have the knockout move, okay? That's what a TKO looks like. Ideally, you want it to be persistent. And then my favorite pattern we discussed last week or a week before is that the accelerating momentum strategy when you have a gradual momentum and then you have an accelerating momentum, okay, or momentum accelerates, and you have persistency, meaning that you could draw a line through a lot of the bars, okay, it tends to go up day after day after day. Then you get that knockout move because everybody's so used to it going up. Remember, it's just psychology, okay? It's not nothing magical about this, okay? It's just human nature, psychology. So you look for that knockout bar. Now let's get back to your chart before I digress too far. If I can find it. It's hard to work with all these windows open. Let's see. Let me get over here. Here we go. Now, so what happened here is that you broke out of the base. You broke out of the base. It's also a little bit on the thin side, by the way. And then you came all the way back to the base. 
So I would immediately write this stock off. But David took off. Well, so what? It could do whatever it wants. You have to have a methodology that, that you follow, knowing that it's not going to be perfect. A stock, a market, a commodity, a forex, it can do whatever it wants, okay? And it has nothing to do with your analysis. Maybe, like I said before, maybe somebody's selling shares because they're getting divorced or something, okay? It has nothing to do with the stock. It has nothing to do with what's going on, but they might just need the money. Okay, so it pulled all the way back to the base. So I would I would write it off just based on that. Uh, HV pretty low on this stock. You want to be trading in more momentum stocks, and this stock doesn't do a whole lot. It tends to just kind of electrocardiogram. Yeah, it took off recently, but well, wait a minute, thirty eight to forty, huh? Let's go back to Trill again. Let's go back to a good stock. Okay, twelve to twenty four. That's a hundred percent. That's what you're looking for, something that can make those kind of moves, as opposed to something like this that can go from 38 to 40. The problem with a lower volatility stock is something bad could always still happen. So your outlier is still there, okay? I mean, look at the, look at this move here, this, this stupid gap here, and it went, let's say you were short that stock, and it, it made this huge gap. So that's an outlier. This is like a... a um, I don't know how many HV move. It's probably huge. Let's see if we can see something in here. He probably had a huge spike in HV on that day. Let's see. Yeah, I mean, look at the, look at look at the. Uh, this is, I think this might be a ratio here, but you could see that that this you had this un, un, unorthodox move based on the HV of the stock. And look right here. This thing just went from here all the way to here. So bad things can still happen in stocks that aren't that volatile. So the stock hardly moves, and all of a sudden it makes a big old chunk, and you think you're, you think you're doing okay by trading a, a lower volatility stock, but in reality you're actually creating a problem, potential problem. So be careful with something like that. Zag is along. Oops. Oh, I can actually answer in here. Oh, well, that's cool. I can actually answer that. If I answer a question, could y'all see that? Oh, I could send it privately or send it all. Oh, okay. Let's send it privately. There we go. Um, Zag? No, we just talked about this one. Did I do it twice? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, HC. Okay, we did that one. I'm forgetting to uh, delete them. CRMD. Yeah, this will have to set up again. It's already taken off. Um, out of a pullback, kind of a pullback. Uh, it's already going up uh, 500 percent. So it's a little dangerous to uh, trade at this juncture. Not that it can't go up another 500%. If you're already long, stay long. But I'd be a little leery about getting in. But who knows? I mean, if it could, if it's got to get, it's got to get well past its prior highs in here, then pull back. Maybe if it gets to 11 or 12 and pulls back, it might be worth a shot again. Uh, good volume, so that's okay. That's good. Okay. Okay. Any, anyone else? Any more? Give it a minute for everything to catch up. Pam, uh, yeah, Pam looks good. Pam is Pam. I should have said Pam's on my Landry list for today. So I agree. It looks good. Um, you see, you've got a gradual uptrend, then you got an accelerated uptrend, okay, and then you also have uh, persistency, and then you have a pullback. So yeah, all of that is for the makings of a good-looking setup. A little bit on the thin side, 200,000, 300,000, but uh, I think still worth tradable. It's tra it's triggered right around now. ISIG, I don't never heard of it. ISIG, um, is that the right symbol? Well, one is super thin. Two, um, net net, it's going sideways for about two years, and then there's no pattern there. Uh, so far, it's just kind of headed lower, so you don't want to buy this stock. Just draw your arrows, okay? Sometimes it can be that simple. When can we get into PAM? You can get into PAM now. Q. 
QRVO, QRVO. I better not, we better not take that sentence out of context, huh? Let me, uh, quick, uh, let's look at another stock quick before I get in trouble. <laughs> uh, yeah. A little light on volume. Uh, kind of wide, loose, longer term. Uh, it's kind of just has this one big wide range bar in here. This looks okay. I could, I think I could pick it apart if I spent enough time on it, but it looks okay. It's broken out and pulled back. I'll say it okay. I mean, it's like I'd almost like a little bit more pullback because it had such an extreme move higher, but it's okay. It's, it's definitely not bad. So whoever, um, TGS, whoever brought it up, John, good eyes. Um, we'll stop a little short of a high five, but it's not bad. Short QRVO for Mr. Nate. Nate, you've been, you've been, <laughs> Nate's been emailing me all these stocks. He's looking to short. Um, well, the problem is it's a new issue, so I would leave it alone as far as shorting. Uh, new issues sometimes have uh, certain aberrations, like we talked about, where they'll have these deep pullbacks and then take off again. So I would just be really careful. Uh, I doubt that you could get share. Uh, somebody could punch up their brokerage and see if you can get shares on it, or you can go to. Um, I think IBB has a. Um, is it IBB? Interactive Brokers has a. Uh, a shortable list that's pretty good if you're if you're don't want to log into your broker account and and, and see. Uh, yeah, it looks like it's kind of. I, I wouldn't buy it at this juncture because it's coming back into its parallel breakout, but I certainly want to short wouldn't short it as an IPO. So be careful on that one. Uh, MVIS. Yeah, this one um, again. This is on the Landry list. Um, it doesn't look great if you look at it from the intermediate term, but this is why you have to back your charts way out. Let me see if I could do this on this screen just for fun. I wonder if I could do this. Um, no, I better not. Let's see if we could put, let me just try something here. Um, if you were to look over my shoulder, This is what my charts would look like. On the right monitor, you'd see the chart on the right. And on the left, you'd see the one on the left. Actually, they're going to be vice versa. So you would see this, and then you would see, you would see this. So when I'm doing my scans, I'm looking over at a chart that might look something like this and catches my eye. And I'm like, okay, well, what's it look like over here, longer term? Well, it's kind of bottomed out. Now I have this maxed out, and it's actually going to be a little bit bigger because, or much bigger because it could be full-size monitor. So we could see that it's bottomed out. It's taken off from lows. So this looks like a pretty good stock. A little dangerous because it's uh, it's running up three or four hundred percent over a short period of time. But in a big picture scheme of things, it's possible this could be a Phoenix stock like we talked about a little while ago. And it's possible this could be the mother of all bottoms. It's very dangerous to trade, okay? So have a stop in place. But we get paid to put capital in harm's way. This is almost a little too aggressive for my core trading service. But it's in the Landry list because some people like Nate out there and Phil like to, like to push the envelope a little bit. And sometimes they get paid off very nicely by doing that. And, and uh you know, God bless you. But, you know, that's why I'm. That's why I show you these guys these things and say, okay, here's one that I like, but it's super duper volatile, and I, I'm a little nervous about putting it in my official recommendations because it's so crazy. I'm afraid somebody's going to get hurt. But yes, absolutely, it's a good looking stock, and it has potential. Now, if it keeps dropping, you avoid it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's twelve days of the pullback. So a few more days of the pullback, and it should come back off of your uh, radar. Q QRVO is a merge of long-standing chip companies. Oh, okay. Well, then, yeah, you can short it. Okay. See, I don't, I, I don't dig that deeply. You want to take a look at it again? QRVO. Somebody was talking about. It. We discussed this stock a while back because somebody was. Um, somebody owned one of the stocks. I mean, it looks okay. You've got some support down below the market. I, I don't think I would short it, even though it is, uh, as you say, uh, out there. Is it uh, are the shares available? 
Andre Amarion. Andre, are you actually in uh, Moscow? Um, I don't like, and this is kind of going way back in time, but I don't like this huge gap down years and years ago. Sometimes stocks have bad memories, okay? And when they try to rally, uh, people that owned it way back here might be looking to sell it. But I certainly hear you. Uh, it looks okay. It's too many days of the pullback, though. Eh, a few more days of the pullback. But longer term, just I don't like that action way back there. I would avoid it because of that. But I certainly hear you, and it's not a bad-looking stock. But when you go way back in time, and then on top of that, you got a lot of uh, resistance. I know it would be a good problem to have if it doubled in value from here. Shorter term looks looks uh, decent. Longer term, not so much. Oh, you're in New York. I thought you were in Russia. Who's in Russia that's in here? Oh, Demetrius is uh, in Russia. I'm sorry. A-M-R-N. <laughs> Demetrius is in uh, Russia, and, and he hasn't been around lately. Hope he's doing okay. AXN? No, we're going to avoid that. Um, I'm not sure what you want to do with that. It's kind of all over the place. Um, it, it's what I call a bottle rocket. It went straight up in here. It went up like a 1,000%, okay, and then it came all the way back in. So I would avoid that. That's not, that's not something that I would be that excited about um, messing around with. Look at your HV, 249. That's just ridiculous, okay? So very dangerous. AMPE, AMPE. Uh, well, the only thing that jumps out at me is that the move was just this. Most most of the move was just one wide range bar. Uh, it looks okay. Uh, it's just not jumping out at me for some reason. Maybe it's because of that bar in there. And it's longer term. You've got all these peaks and all to deal with. So I think I'd pass based on that. Shorter term, I hear you. That's a good eye. But uh, longer term, I don't know. Okay, uh, Q or VO shortable, but I wouldn't. But I wouldn't. Growing profits at thirty nine cents, thirty nine percent up. Phil's look at that fundamentals. Don't confuse the issue with facts, Phil. I, I thought you'd do better than that. No, it's not my way or highway. If you if you could find something that works for you, then by all means use it. I've just tried to stick to my method. If I came in here and one day I'm talking about uh, earnings, and then one day I'm talking about reversal trading, and then one day I'm talking about candles, and then one day I'm talking about bar charts. I think after a while, um, it would drive you guys batty. And certainly, you can't be consistent as a trader in that. I, I, I see people, I don't see them anymore because I avoid them, but I, I see people blog about every method in the world, and I'm thinking, there's no way in hell that that person could actually trade because you can't trade a thousand different methods. On Monday, you're talking about stochastics, and on Tuesday, you're talking about RSI, and on Wednesday, I don't know, you're counting waves. Uh, Thursdays, Thursdays are for moving averages. You know, it's like, give me a break. You got you to gotta pick something simple and stick with it, and if you boil all down my stuff, it's like we're looking for the trend, or we're looking for emerging trend, and we're looking for a pullback to get on the trend. For the most part, that's what we're doing. Now, we might incorporate a few other these things into the equation to help us out, but we're not doing a stochastic and a Fibonacci and the counting of the waves and all this other stuff. We're just doing a few simple things to uh, determine the trade. Okay, GTLS, you've got a little overhead supply in here. It's not set up. Uh, it would have to get past the overhead supply for me to get excited, but then it's got more problems over here. So it's okay. I mean, if you had this, if this chart six months into the future and it's still bottoming out, it might look a little bit better to be and maybe it'll make like the mother of all cup and handles but right now I'd leave it alone because it's overhead supply GTLS SMA at 50 okay let's take a look at that 200 SMA oops 200 I don't know why this thing jumps everywhere okay all right, it's at 50, so I don't understand what – that doesn't mean anything, does it? Does that mean anything? I'm not sure that means anything. Court? Uh, no, it's too much of a bottle rocket. Did we talk about this one already? It just went straight up in here. It's too, it's too much of a move. It's too much of a good thing. Okay, 
Going to 50? Well, no, no. Howard said it's going to 50 because it's 250. Uh, it might, but that's not how I trade, okay? I mean, you can't say that it's going to definitely go to the 200-day moving average. I mean, if you do that, then um, no, I, don't, I, I disagree, but respectfully disagree. I mean, if you think that if, if that's what you if that's how you trade now, if you're trading reversion to the mean when a market gets stretched this far away from the moving average, you look to buy it because it's a bounce back to the moving average, then, then that's fine. But that's not how I trade. But no, it, there's no guarantee it's going to go to the 50. Look at look at all the look at all the um, resistance above. I mean, now keep in mind it can do whatever it wants. Six months from now, or six days from now, or seven days from now, when we do another show. You can't say, hey, Dave, remember that stock? It said it was going to the moving average. It went to the moving average. But as a general statement, they won't always do that, okay? So, but if that's how you trade, then trade like that. It's just not my style. Not my way of the highway, as I say quite often. Anyway, I think we're getting close. Let's see if I can find the my way highway sign. My way highway. Here we go. Never guarantee I'm playing odds. Okay, I hear you. Okay, if you're playing odds, you know what? Then, then, then if that if you're good doing it, then do it. Yeah, it's not by way of the highway. I mean, if you have a methodology involved in the 200-day moving average, then by all means do it. Phil does a lot of stuff with the 50-day moving average, and for the most part, I agree with him, but not completely. But I kind of see where he's coming from, and he seems to do fairly well with it. It always seems to make the 50-day, but you might be a lot poorer unless it goes straight to zero that is it always seems to make 50 but you might be a lot poorer unless it goes straight to zero okay what are you saying Phil it always makes the 50 but you might be a lot poorer unless it goes straight to zero that is it has to make the 50 at some point uh, yeah let me think about that it has to make the 50 at some point huh but it could be go a lot lower. Okay, it has to make the 50 at some point. Well, I guess if you got into something that, I mean, I guess this, this could go to zero. Well, a company could go bankrupt before they uh, they hit the moving average. But I hear, I think what I, I think I hear you say it, yeah, it's more likely to hit the 50 than 200. Yeah, I, I'll I'll give you that. Well, I think my time is up. Uh, any last questions we could squeeze in real quick? I, uh, I appreciate you guys taking time and busy schedule to be here, guys and girls. Um, as you can tell, I love these shows. Again, it's not my way or highway, so if, if you don't fully agree with me, that's fine. Uh, that's what makes a market anyway. But uh, thanks for uh, taking time to listen to me and listen to what I have to say. I appreciate that. Uh, any unanswered questions, Dave at DaveLandry.com. Uh, I think I'll be in and out all weekend doing some honeydew, so shoot me an email uh, between now and um, now and then if you have any questions. And if uh, we don't talk, I guess we'll talk again next week. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Leon. Appreciate that. Thank you, James. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Nates. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you, guys.